shining in the midst of the darkness shining jesus light of the world shine upon us set us free by the truth you now bring us shine on me shine on me shine jesus shine fill this land with the father's glory grace spirit blaze set our hearts on fire flow river flow flood the with grace and mercy send forth your word Lord and let there be light Good evening for those who don't know me my name is Carl Dye and I'm the preaching minister at the Eastgate Church of Christ in Salem Springs Arkansas and on behalf of our congregation I want to thank you for joining us for our Wednesday evening Bible study if you'd like to know more about our upcoming YouTube events, don't forget to hit the subscribe button down below and turn on notifications so you'll be notified of our YouTube events, such as our Sunday morning worship services. Speaking of our Sunday morning worship services, we've returned to one worship service on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock. We'll continue to live stream this worship service on our church Facebook page. Simply visit our church website. There is a link to our Facebook page on the website homepage, follow that link, then like the page and you should be notified when we go live. We will also continue to record this service and upload it to this YouTube page for those who wish to view it on this platform. Hopefully it will be ready to premiere by noon each Sunday. For the immediate future, our Wednesday night class will remain on our YouTube channel only, premiering at 6 p.m. each Wednesday evening. Tonight will be the final lesson on how to explain. I trust that you have enjoyed this series as much as I have and have learned how to more effectively share your faith with others. It will also be my last lesson to present to you as I have accepted a position in Searcy, Arkansas and have uh, begun working full time in Searcy uh, on this past Monday. But uh, tonight I want to cover three questions that I've been asked about in the past. We'll start with a question that many people have and it goes all the way back to the beginning we want to know why God put the tree in the garden in the first place I mean why did he put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil where it was so easily accessible to Adam and Eve uh, why did he make it so that it was uh, desirable fruit I mean why couldn't it have been a ugly looking fruit that they wouldn't have wanted another question comes from the book of Revelation and concerns the mark of the beast. What does this mean? Is this a physical mark by a government or is it figurative? The final question deals with a parable Jesus told that seems, well, it seems a bit on the harsh side and totally out of character for Jesus. Right now Doug Hartman is going to lead us in the song He Has Made Me Glad and then we'll get to the answers to these questions. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. First, let's look at the question, why did God put the tree in the garden? Now, the Bible says God tempts no man. Well, the passage being referenced in the second part of the question is James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15, which reads, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. 
Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. So yes, it is true that God does not tempt anyone. But look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 9. It says, And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So yes, God put the tree right there in the garden. Now if you skip over to verses 16 and 17 of Genesis 2, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. So God put the trees in the garden and said, Don't eat from it. It's very clear, seems like, Fairly simple to follow his rules, right? Well, after the serpent has approached Eve, look at what Genesis 3 verse 6 says. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. So the tree produced fruit. Fruit that was pleasing to the eye. Fruit that people might, that Adam and Eve might want to eat. Now, why didn't God just make the fruit uh, bad looking or ugly and so that people wouldn't want to eat it? Well, we don't know. So why did God put the tree in the garden? Well, let's find the answer and base it on what we read earlier in James 1, 13 through 15. First of all, notice that man attempts to shift the blame. Remember, First, verse 13, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil. So, man attempts to shift the blame. In fact, it started that way in the beginning. Look at Adam and Eve's responses when uh, God confronts them. Adam blamed Eve. And he also blamed God, by the way. He says, the woman you gave me. Eve blamed the serpent. So they tried to shift the blame. So who can we blame when we sin, when we give in to temptation? Were Adam and Eve right? Can we possibly escape the responsibility? Can we perhaps even blame God? Well, 1 Corinthians 10.13 tells us, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. So God does not tempt us. God provides the way out of the temptation. So where does the blame lie then? Well, that's verses 14 and 15 of James chapter 1. We are responsible. Plain and simple. We are responsible. It is our own evil desires that tempt us. It is our own evil desires that drag us away. It is our own evil desires that lead to sin. We would not want to sin if sin were not so attractive. But you see, God gave us a gift. He gave us choice. He made us free to choose. Adam and Eve did not have to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They didn't have to. They chose to eat. Adam, after Eve ate, did not have to eat. Okay. Eve ate, and then she gave some to her husband, who Adam knew where the fruit had come from. He didn't have to eat, yet he chose to eat. With freedom comes responsibility. Galatians 5 verse 13 tells us we are called to be free, but not to use our freedom as an excuse to sin. 1 Peter 2.16 says we should not use freedom as a cover-up for evil. Yes, God did put the tree in the garden. But no, he did not tempt Adam and Eve. God made the rules and gave them the choice to obey or not to obey. The tempter, Satan, did the tempting. We're not told, we're not, and they we're not told that they gave the rule a second thought you know, and, until Satan enters the story. It, we're not even told that they noticed the tree. They, it was there. They probably did notice it, but they didn't talk about it. They didn't try to eat from it before until Satan enters the story. So my conclusion, 
based on what we've talked about, is that God made us free to choose to do right or to choose to do wrong. Our use of this freedom to do wrong is not an indictment against God. Creating man without choice would have been creating robots and would have made righteousness meaningless. If we do or did right only because we could not do otherwise, of what value would that be to God? How much glory could that bring to God if we had no choice in the matter? But because God did give us choice, when we choose the right path, it does mean something. It means something to us, and I think more importantly, it means something to God as well. So let's turn our attention now to the second question about the mark of the beast. Now a little bit of background as to how this question perhaps came about. Um, the, uh, several years back on Facebook, that fountain of uh, truth and everything right, I guess, I don't know, uh, someone read a post on Facebook that uh, said something to the effect that our government was going to start requiring us to get a mark or have something implanted right under the skin of our right hand in order to do, to do business. And there's been a resurging interest in this with talk of a vaccine for the COVID-19 virus that uh, Bill Gates says can contain a microchip and, and be used to track people and everything. Well, let's start this evening by looking at the five passages that mention the mark of the beast. The primary passage under consideration is Revelation 13, verses 16 through 18, which reads this way. And he performed uh, Revelation 13, 16 through 18. He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead, so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast and the number of his name. This calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is man's number. His number is 666. That again is the primary passage under consideration when we talk about the mark of the beast. A couple of other, other passages though that mention um, the mark of the beast. Revelation 14 verses 9 and 10. Those with the mark will drink, quote, the wine of God's fury. Then in Revelation chapter 16 verses 1 and 2 it says the first bowl of God's wrath uh, was poured out and ugly painful sores developed on those with the mark of the beast. In Revelation 19 verse 20, it speaks of those with the mark having been deceived by the beast. And Revelation chapter 20 verse 4, those martyred had not received the mark. There is however one other passage that we need to look at to fully understand and, and, and know about what uh, this is past talking about. And that passage is Revelation chapter 7, verses 3 and 4. It says this, Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. This is referencing not physical Israel, but spiritual Israel. The ones who belong to God they receive a seal on the forehead. So is this seal literal or figurative? Well, if it's a literal seal, then we all should have some sort of a seal on our forehead, either the mark of the beast or the seal of God. I mean, you're either one or the other, right? So most would say that this is a figurative seal that's being spoken of in Revelation 7. Uh, Revelation is a highly symbolic book to start with, and this just makes more sense to assume that the mark here, or the seal here, is talking about a, a, a symbolic mark, a figurative seal. Based on my interpretation of Revelation, the first beast is the one that comes out of the sea, is the Roman Empire. The second, the one that comes out of the earth, is the enforcers of emperor worship. Thus, two conclusions that we can come to about the mark of the beast is that the mark is a metaphor for devotion to the emperor. 
that it is not a physical mark on the outside of a person's body or a microchip that is implanted just underneath the skin of someone's body. It is the stamp, it is the stamp of paganism impressed upon the character and conduct of idolaters. In John's imagery, the way it works is this. You either have a seal indicating that you are owned by God, or you have a mark, meaning and indicating allegiance to the emperor. Neither one is a physical thing. Either one is a spiritual thing. So my conclusion, a person shows by what he or she does, the mark on his right hand, or even by what he or she thinks, the mark on the forehead, who he or she belongs to. Thus, the mark of the beast is not a physical government identification mark or a card or a chip or anything of the sort, but it is a spiritual indication of allegiance to anyone or anything other than God. And so finally, let's turn our attention to the question about the guest without a wedding garment. It concerns the parable in, Mark, in Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. Do you remember the story? Um, King invites many, many guests to his wedding garment, but what wedding celebration for his son, and they all make excuses as to why they can't come. And so finally the king goes out and gets his servants to get the people from all over and just bring in people so that his hall will be filled with guests. We pretty well understand the first ten verses, which I sort of summarized there. Uh, the Jews were invited to the wedding banquet, but they refused to attend. So God opened up the invitation to everyone else. But what about verses 11 through 14? Well, let's start by reading Matthew 22, verses 11 through 14. It says, But when the king came to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, Tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. So let's begin by looking at the observation of the king. He sees a man who is not wearing the proper clothing. Now, wearing the right clothing to a formal dinner honors the host and the occasion. Not wearing the right clothes can be taken as an insult. If you were invited to a formal dinner and you decided that you were going to go in cut-off jeans and a t-shirt, that would be an insult to your host. And in all likelihood, your host may actually ask you to leave because you didn't meet with his conditions. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. But the observation of the king of a man not wearing proper clothing to the wedding feast. Weddings were a big deal, an important occasion in that day. And they still are, or at least they should be. Getting cleaned up and dressed up was a way of showing appreciation and respect for the fact that someone thought enough of you to invite you to attend this celebration. Now then, but what's the importance of the clothes? I mean, why do clothes matter so much? I mean, sure, the man maybe wasn't dressed as he was supposed to be. Maybe it was the best clothes that he had and everything. Well, if you think about it, and if you read the first part of the, of the parable, the first ten verses, and you find out that these people were just people who were grabbed by the servants and brought into the banquet, you have to wonder how could anyone have been properly attired for the occasion? Anyone who accepted the king's invitation, how could they have been properly attired if they were just uh, rounded up at the last minute from the street corners and anywhere else they could be found? I mean, even if they did have time to dress, surely most would be poor and they wouldn't have appropriate clothing for such an occasion as the wedding of a king's son. But see, commentators will tell us that the king himself provided the garments for the people to wear to the wedding celebration. So all the guests had to do was put them on. That's it. Sounds simple, right? 
Well, this man refused to make the small effort involved in putting on the proper clothing. So even if this was the quote-unquote best he had, it was not what the king had provided. Thus, it was not acceptable. And in fact, it was disrespectful toward the king. It's important to remember that accepting an invitation means accepting the terms of the invitation. If you were to go to a restaurant that has a sign that says, coat and tie required, don't show up in jeans and a t-shirt and expect a warm reception or to get a table. There's a dress code that is put forth, announced ahead of time, if you want to eat here, you wear a coat and a tie. Accepting the invitation means accepting the terms of the invitation. Now, at first glance, it seems like a small thing, but it's not. This guy thought he could come to the king's feast on his own terms, thinking that his own clothes were just as good as the king's clothes that he had provided, or maybe if not, they were good enough. Forget about what the king wanted or the king had provided for the feast. And so often, isn't that the case with people and the kingdom of God? A lot of people want to be a part of the feast, but they want to do it on their own terms. They don't want to submit to God's terms. So what's the moral of the story, or my conclusion, I guess we could call it? Well, the first is, grace doesn't eliminate standards. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, Paul writes, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift, of God, the gift of God. God gave us a wonderful, wonderful gift when he sent Jesus to die on the cross for us. It was a gift that cost him very dearly, though. Grace has been defined as God's riches at Christ's expense, and that's exactly what it is. Romans 6, 1 and 2 says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? So just because we have grace doesn't mean that it doesn't matter what we do or that it doesn't matter if we sin because God's grace is going to cover it. You know, I, I know of, I had a friend in junior high who said, you know, he thought, well, it's God's job to forgive, so it doesn't really matter what we do. Well, that's not the Christian way to think. Paul says, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? No way. Forget about that. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? So the moral of the story, the first part, grace doesn't eliminate standards. The second part is that when we come to God, we must do it on His terms. We must submit to Him. He is the king. He gives the terms. And if not, if we try to come to him on our own terms, well, we may think that we are, quote unquote, in the party, but eventually we're going to be found out and he's going to throw us out. Just like what happened to the guest without the proper wedding garment. God still gives us choices today. God wants us to make the right choices, the choices that He would make for us. But He still leaves it up to us to decide what to do when we're faced with temptations. After we decide to make Jesus our Lord, that greatest, greatest of decisions, God gives us a seal that shows that we belong to Him. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 tells us, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. God gives us the Holy Spirit as a seal of his ownership of us when we decide to follow him and to put on Christ. So what are the terms to accepting God's invitation of ownership? Well, we must hear the gospel, Romans 10, 17 tells us. We must believe the gospel, Mark 16, 16 tells us. 
We must confess our sins, Acts 8.37 tells us, and we must also confess Jesus as Lord, uh, Romans 10.9 and 10 tells us. We must repent of our sins, changing our heart, Acts 2, verse 38. We must be immersed in water to have our sins washed away, Acts 22, 16. And thus we clothe ourselves with Christ, Galatians 3, verse 27. And then we must live a life of faithful service to God, Revelation 2, verse 10 tells us. Have you made that choice to belong to Jesus? Are you marked with his seal? Have you accepted God's offer on his terms? If not, we sure would like to help you. All you have to do is let us know and we'll do whatever we can to help you make the best decision of all. And that's true even if you're not in the Northwest Arkansas or Northeast Oklahoma area. We can put you in touch with someone who is near to you in your area, who is just as interested in helping you get to heaven as we are. Just let us know. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we are so grateful to you that you provided us with a fantastic gift, the gift of choice. Father, I pray that we will all make the choice to serve you. And Father, that as we make that choice to serve you and you send the Holy Spirit as a, as a way of showing that you own us now and that you are in charge of our lives, Father, I pray that we'll show that to other people. And I pray that we will accept this offer on your terms, on the terms that you gave that are so very important and so, so very easy for us to follow. Father, I pray for guidance in the things that we do and the things that we say. May we always, always be a reflection of you. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll plan on being back here again next Wednesday night at 6 p.m. Until then, may God bless and keep you healthy and safe. And remember that we, and more importantly, God loves you.